Thanks very much for, for the introduction. Uh, thanks very much, Ifa, and all the team in Middle Life Science for, uh, for this invitation. I'm really excited to be here. I hope I don't say a lot of nonsense today and that I can convince you uh, a little bit what I will, will try to say uh, today. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen uh, with you guys. Just bear with me for a moment. Uh, can you all see it? Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, to start. Are you? I'm going to use uh, the case of vaccine hesitancy as as an example, but this can be applied to. Uh, other areas uh, in, in medical science and, and, and in fact in any other uh, areas of science. But this is a this is an area that uh, has struck uh, a chord with me uh, for several personal reasons. And so that's why I decided to focus on this. And um, I wanted to, to start with this image, uh, which maybe some of you have seen circulated uh, on social media a few years back. And uh, I have no idea the origin of the photo. If anyone has pointed, just let me know later. But the, the post uh, was claiming that this was a classic example how media can manipulate information. If you focus on the left-hand side uh, of the picture, uh, it could be used as an evidence of violence and cruelty. Whereas if you focus on the right side of kindness and compassion, the real for picture, uh, it's, it's obviously far more complex than that. And we can speculate many things, but without the context, uh, it's impossible. Even the full picture is, is already cropped. So we don't know where this is, uh, what's happening. And um, so it's, it gives us very little to go on except our perceptions. So um, what this image real force teaches me is that uh, our perception of the truth can really change depending on the perspective that is presented to us and even from our own bias. An interesting example of this uh, was published a few years back. Uh, this is um, from the Our World in Data. And this is statistics on the cause of death in the US. So here on the uh, left hand side, these are the real causes of death. So you can see the distribution of different types. Whereas on the right hand side, <clears throat> what you can see is what the media focuses on. So they provided an example from two uh, quite respectable newspapers, actually. In the middle, uh, what you're going to see is what people actually researched on Google. So what strikes me the most is that although heart disease was causing 30% of the deaths in the US in that particular year, it was pretty much neglected whereas people were much focused on homicide and terrorism, which together cause less than 1% of that. So there are many explanations uh, for this, uh, but one that I would like to focus on is what the psychologists uh, now are calling our negative bias. What that means is that we have a tendency of focusing on negative news. Anytime that you tune on the news, it's, can't kind of daunting, really. It's all gloomy, gloom and gloom uh, all day. And the reason that psychologists claim uh, we have this negative bias is that because our brains, they are wired uh, to focus on negative news as a way of a survival instinct. What that means is that the more we pay attention to perceived dangers, the more we protect ourselves from harm. So this brings me um, to vaccine hesitancy. There is a, more, a lot more to it, of course, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through it, through it all today. But I would like to just acknowledge what's the role of the media and social media in particular in this. This is something that has been going on for the best part of the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, but uh, in 2019, um, WHO finally added vaccine hesitancy to the list of the 10 global deaths, uh, global health threats, sorry together with things like HIV and Ebola. The vaccine hesitancy is it's a broad term, which of course includes uh, what we know, some of you might know as the anti-vaxxer movement. 
So this always started actually with this man. Um, his name is Andrew Wakefield. Field. And in 1998, he published a fraudulent paper uh, in a very prestigious journal called The Lancet, linking measles vaccine with autism. This got a lot of uh, media coverage at the time. Uh, there was widespread outcry. And as a result, many parents decided that they would stop vaccinating the children. Now, uh, 12 years later, uh, the fraud was fully uncovered. The paper was retracted. This man lost his uh, medical registration and everything. But by then, the damage was already done. So this graph here uh, shows us uh, the, the effect of the vaccines uh, campaign. So this is particularly the, the measles vaccine. So they, in the, that's in the US, so they started vaccinating children uh, that's around the 60s. And as you can see, there was a dramatic drop uh, in the number of cases in just um, a few years, really. So we had, we dropped down from a, about half a million cases a year down to a few hundreds. But here on the inset, uh, you might notice, not if you can see my pointer, here on the inset, you see that from 2000, so just a couple of years after the paper was published, we started to see the cases rising again. And probably many of you have heard of uh, measles outbreaks in big cities like New York or, or London. Now, I promised myself I was not gonna talk uh, about COVID, but vaccine hesitancy has a role uh, in what uh, we are seeing nowadays. So um, you see that countries like France or, or Italy, there's a lot of um, people are not keen on taking the jab at the moment. And this has much to do with this widespread information that vaccines are dangerous. So in fact, even before there was a COVID vaccine, a poll suggested that at least half of the world population had concerns on taking the vaccine and were not really keen on doing that. Now, the vaccine came out uh, fairly quickly. And as you know, a lot of people are suspicious of that. Uh, although they don't know that behind the vaccine that came out, there was 20 years of research uh, on it. But once the vaccine came out, of course, there were some cases of uh, side effects. And there was, again, a lot of coverage on these particular cases. So uh, you probably heard about the blood clots and everything. And panic spread again. And people didn't want to take the jabs and people were refusing to take the jabs. And AstraZeneca vaccine was... Uh, pretty much banned from the from the, the rounds of vaccination and everything. But um, if we if we take a moment to just analyze these numbers, uh, I like this infograph because it puts things a little bit in perspective. So it's getting back to the Jack's example of the, ch the sharks. So I think we kill a lot more sharks than sharks kill us, and this is exactly the same. So here we focus on the risks of the vaccine whereas the benefits are far greater. So if you, re if you pay attention to these numbers here, the chances of having blood clots if you get infected by COVID are 40,000 higher than the chances of getting blood clots from the actual, the actual jab. And a lot of things are in between this. So just common uh, things that we have in our daily lives like smoking or birth control pills have a far higher risk of blood clots than the or the, the, any vaccine. So this brings me back uh, to this idea of perceived danger. Uh, what we are seeing is that despite the fact that we have far more evidence of the vaccine's benefits, we are only focusing on the risks and not analyzing the bigger picture. So how is that media and social media really are influencing this? Now for starters, um, social media was uh, virtually unchecked, <clears throat> excuse me, virtually unchecked uh, for for many years. So anyone can write a post or make a video about their own personal opinion. 
And if I like that video or that post, I just share with my network and my network share with the network and the, that information, good or bad, is just amplified. So what we have is an information overload. So we are daily bombarded with all kinds of posts, videos, pictures, um, a wealth of, um, of things that it's, it's pretty hard actually to deal with. Even some uh, medical scientists now are mentioning cases of information, uh, information uh, fatigue. So we get so much that we cannot deal with it. And I find that this access to, to information, this uh, overwhelming access to information has, has a dark side. And together with our lovely daily uh, fix of funny cat videos, we have a lot of misleading information, hoaxes, conspiracy theories, which I'm not touching uh, so much now, but I think Stephen is gonna mention this. And all this in the end, it adds to our negative bias. So I am not trying to sell any uh, conspiracy theories here before anyone's thinking about that. So I don't think there's a huge conspiracy plot from the media to drive us crazy. But uh, it's really hard for scientists um, and for journalists to really translate uh, what we have uh, in the science knowledge into a language that it's easy to understand uh, by everyone. But for example, um, I have recently uh, run a workshop in science communication with medical students, and I asked them to create a headline based on scientific papers. So uh, this paper, for example, uh, was about use of cannabinoids to treat a form of childhood epilepsy. So what's see here, don't need to uh, worry about reading <clears throat> all this, but what we have here is a lot of different uh, titles that were provided by the students. Some of them focus on, wow, that's great news, we have a new treatment for epilepsy, whereas others focus on the fact that there was a lot of side effects in the particular treatment. And this group, for example, they are brilliant, uh, I laughed for weeks about with this, uh, they decided to give a tabloid approach and made the title that completely would mislead the reader if that was a real um, newspaper headline. So, because the perspectives are different so, and we have so much information, how can we separate the chef from the wheat? Now, I think that uh, a good way forward is really to start questioning the information that we receive. Does that even make sense? Like you can use your common sense and uh, analyze what you are hearing and reading. But there are other points of view to that. So let's, can we try to focus on different uh, ways of looking into the same uh, piece of information? And the most important of all, is this source reliable? So um, I like this example, uh, going back to uh, my uh, story of the, the vaccine hesitancy because this, this was a post a few years back. And this person said, I'm not an anti-vax, but I understand why some parents do not want those chemicals in the children's bodies. I think instead of chemical shots, the doctor should give a small piece of the virus so the body can build natural immunity. Like the chicken pox play dates we had as kids. Now, I could find that his post is quite, um, his argument is quite compelling, he or she, the argument is quite compelling and it makes sense. And if I didn't know uh, what, how vaccines work, I would share that with my network and my network would share them with that, their network. And then this unease about vaccine would spread. Now, if I took the time to just go to any source of information, a little bit more reliable, for example, Wikipedia, which again, is not the most reliable, but a little bit better, I would have, um, find out that his alternative to vaccination is actually a vaccination. So um, I think that I, I would like to, to summarize this uh, by saying that we need to be aware of our own negative biases and 
that there are different perspectives, different points of view to every bit of information. Information is always the same, but the way that we take on it may be completely different from person to person, from country to country, from religious group to religious group, and etc. Also, we need to remember that translating scientific information can be very challenging and a lot uh, can be lost in translation in the process. And we need to get in the habit of questioning everything that we read or, or hear. It's not... So before, um, before uh, sharing anything, we also need to get in the habit of checking if that's true or not. I just put here basically a, a link, one of the many tools uh, that are available now for, for fact check online. Um, just uh, as a final note, uh, there are a lot of now uh, very interesting resources. Uh, this, these are people that I find very nice uh, on, on Twitter for those who use them. Uh, first one, Dr. Viles, she's from New Zealand and the author of the famous Flatten the Curve uh, cartoons. You got sick of hearing uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. I, I want to look on you uh, in Trinity College, uh, who has a weekly program. Uh, in, in New Stock Radio, if I'm not mistaken. For those who have kids, uh, Amoeba Sisters is very nice with cartoons and gifts and everything. Um, just another, a few more links uh, that are very useful as well. A lot of good uh, scientific information being um, shared there. In particular, Chris Pazat, uh, I managed to pronounce it, I'm very proud of myself, uh, which has very cool animations on different topics on science. And finally, I will do absolutely recommend everyone to hear uh, this podcast that I highlighted here uh, about the, the very genetic, about the use of internet and how internet has evolved over the years. And finally, I just want to uh, leave you with uh, artwork from my daughter, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks to all the team uh, at Midland Science for the um, opportunity to come and to, to speak with you all today and to share some some insights from um, my research on conspiracy theories. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now so you can see um, my slides. Is that okay? Can everybody see the screen? Yeah, all good. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so, so the topic that I, I'm going to speak about today is, um, I suppose, around conspiracy theories, what they are, and, and really, I suppose, trying to get into that question of, of why people uh, believe in them. So my colleagues and I have been researching the rise of conspiracy theories in Britain over um, the last four years or so. And our research is, is ethnographic in nature. And so that means that we, we basically carry out the research by observing and participating within conspiracy theories communities or what they like to call themselves, I suppose, I suppose more, more, um, more often is uh, truth seeker communities. Um, and so when we're carrying out the research, we spend a lot of our time basically attending conferences, um, going to community events and, and, and also spending time just visiting people in their homes having conversations with them and, and we spend some of our time kind of watching the way that they, they use social media from, you know, from, from the kind of, from uh, within their homes. And then beyond that, we, we also spent time um, participating in online communities and, and observing and recording uh, what happens in those kind of online forums. And I suppose the goal then of this ethnographic perspective really is for us to be able to um, develop a kind of an insider's perspective of what life is like within the conspiracy theory community. And so in a, in a lot of ways, this, this approach to research kind of shares the same values that, that Jackie uh, mentioned in the beginning of, of her talk today about we're recognizing the importance, the importance, I suppose, of, of being able to, to listen to other people and to be able to hear what they have to say and to hear, I suppose, in a kind of a, a genuine way. Um, and the idea with that then is that we can learn from uh, people who, I guess, are, are usually put into a position of being others. And so we try to understand and to empathize with that perspective. And I think conspiracy theories is, is, is a topic that really very much kind of falls into um, that kind of realm, and particularly the, the people who, who believe in conspiracy theories. So 
when we would have started out this research, conspiracy theories were pretty much a, a fringe topic. And it was certainly not something that was seen as a, as a major societal issue. But I think we're all probably aware of how much this has changed during the pandemic. And in lots of different ways, the pandemic seems to have created fertile ground for conspiracy theories to spread. Many people have experienced unemployment, isolation, financial pressure and, and restrictive movements. You know, these are things that if, if we thought we, we would have kind of had these experiences two years ago, a lot of people would have said, no, you know, that sounds like a conspiracy. And so we've actually gone through this and, you know, it's, it's, it's been very difficult for a lot of us to, to understand and to make sense of. And understandably, with a lot of people spending more time at home and spending more time on social media, people have found themselves online looking for answers to explain the pandemic. But also, I think more importantly, they've been looking for answers to understand and to explain their changed lives within the pandemic. And so in, in this kind of short talk that I'm going to do today, then, I'll try to explain a little about what conspiracy theories are and hopefully um, show you some of the reasons why the people who participated in our study uh, believe in conspiracy theories. And to do that, I'm going to show you a few pieces of data that, that we would have collected from interviews. And hopefully uh, that will give you a chance to kind of, I suppose, see the human side of conspiracy theories and understand and empathize, hopefully, with how people get drawn into them. So I guess the first thing that we can do in setting this all up is to, to look at how much conspiracy theories have actually flourished. Um, and I suppose what we know is that conspiracy theories thrive in conditions of uncertainty. And that's, you know, obviously the, the pandemic has created uh, a huge condition of, of uncertainty. And the, the surveys or the polling data revealed that 20 percent of British people believed that the COVID-19 was a hoax, and many of them believed that it was caused by the installation of 5G technology. So there is this kind of whole array of polling data that evidences this significant uptake in belief in conspiracy theories. We see that 30% of people believe the COVID-19 death toll is being deliberately reduced or hidden by the authorities. One in seven people believe the death toll is being deliberately exaggerated by the authorities. And more than one in 20 people believe that the symptoms that most people blame on COVID-19 are actually connected to the rollout of 5G technology. But the important point that we can see from all of this polling data really is the idea that conspiracy theories are prospering in this specific moment in time at rates that are unprecedented in, in Britain's history. But there are obviously some really negative social consequences that uh, come or are associated with this uptake in belief in, in conspiracy theories. And that makes it a topic that's pretty difficult to ignore right now at the moment. And some recent research indicates that people who have a conspiratorial worldview are more likely to remove themselves from democratic processes. They're more likely to be vaccine hesitant and reject public health information. But I guess worryingly, recent research has also shown us that belief in conspiracy theories may support the increase in violence. And I guess this is kind of significant, or we can see examples of this when we consider that um, across Europe and North America and Australia recently, people have been burning down 5G towers and abusing 5G engineers because of their belief in, in 5G conspiracies. But I guess it's, it's also important that we kind of take a step back and, and try to understand, you know, what conspiracies really are. And in their, maybe their most simplest terms, conspiracy theories are elaborate stories which claim that various sinister groups operate behind the scenes to control the course of world's events. Conspiracy theories then, they typically fall into one of three categories in terms of their scale. So um, some conspiracy theories are created around single events like 9-11 or the assassination of JFK. And then we have these kind of more wide reaching conspiracies which draw on explanations relating to groups such as New World Order or, or maybe the Rothschilds. And finally, then we have what are called super conspiracy theories, which the, the likes of David Icke in the UK is famous for, or, or um, Steve Bannon in the US is also, I guess, somebody who's known for these kind of super conspiracy theories. And these kinds of conspiracy theories basically draw connections between a range of other conspiracy theories with the aim of basically trying to explain everything about how society 
and our everyday lives are organized and controlled by a powerful, evil and corrupt uh, group of, of elites. But regardless of their scale, conspiracy theories tend to present the existence of two realities. So there's the reality that's given official status, and then there's this invisible backstage in which powerful conspir conspirators operate in secrecy in order to control pretty much everything about our lives. But in keeping with the scope of today's forum, I think it's important that we also consider, consider conspiracy theories as a, as a form of knowledge and we maybe differentiate them from other forms of knowledge. So traditionally, knowledge claims would come from institutions like universities, medical and scientific communities and governmental agencies. And knowledge is usually created by people who are trained experts within uh, very specialist fields. But conspiracy theories typically involve, involve a rejection of these authorities, and so they tend to be almost kind of hostile to these kind of uh, institutions. So by their very nature, conspiracy theories move away from the idea that there is one objective truth, which is really important when we understand what conspiracy theorists actually do, because this idea that there isn't just one truth uh, creates a situation where uh, truth seekers' lives really revolve around discovering their own alternative truths. So in this way, then, conspiracy theories can be treated like any other kind of cultural narrative or what the, the sociologist um, Ari Hofstadter calls a deep story. And what we see with this idea of deep stories is that uh, the, the kind of the facts of conspiracy theories don't necessarily need to be true for people, but what matters to them is how true the story feels and how it allows them to address, uh, uh, to address uh, particular anxieties and problems that they're experiencing within their everyday lives. So when we uh, looked at this idea of the narrative structure of conspiracy theories, we saw that there were a few kind of uh, recurring themes that pop out across basically all of the different conspiracy theories that we looked at. And these three ideas are the, the idea that, that nothing happens by accident, nothing is as it seems, and everything is connected. And so this is what really creates a kind of a perfect condition for people to, to become kind of engaged in the act of conspiracy theorizing. So in taking a step back and asking the question about what are conspiracy theories, we can see that they exist as a kind of a form of stigmatized knowledge. So that is kind of knowledge claims that have not been accepted by the institutions that we typically rely upon for, for true validation. And so conspiracy theories kind of fall into a category that's similar to belief in horoscopes, in UFOs, uh, unaccepted cancer cures, um, and those kind of um, stigmatized, other types of, of stigmatized knowledge. So now I suppose that we have some sense of what conspiracy theories are, we have a foundation to ask the possibly more interesting question about why people believe in conspiracy theories. So this is uh, a piece of data that we would have got from Peter, who is uh, pretty much at this stage a, a veteran of the truth seeker community. And in this interview, um, Peter reflected back on the events that had led him to become engaged in the community. And I'll just give you a chance to, to read that quote for yourself. So when we look at this quote, what we can see is that Peter's negative experiences in his interactions with what he considered to be incompetent health workers was a significant moment in his kind of moment of awakening or becoming a truth seeker. And many of our uh, participants shared similar experience where they had these kind of negative interactions with state institutions. And because of these, they were, they were left with really strong feelings of resentment and contempt for authorities. And so in Peter's case, we can see how this very personal experience fueled then a more general breakdown in trust towards institutions and those kind of uh, sources of authority that we usually uh, value in terms of you know, the information that we, we choose to believe. Even. So what we saw, I guess, repeatedly across all of our interviews was this idea that, that, uh, that conspiracy theories and belief in them is kind of primed by these negative personal interactions with institutions and the kind of strong feelings of resentment and contempt that follow from these interactions. 
The second big idea that, that kind of pops up when we analyze the data, I suppose, was around um, the, the significance of, of uh, online interaction and, and collaboration. And so this second piece of data from Ellie Rose's interview gives us some real insights into how people interact with other truth seekers within um, online communities. And I guess it's important to, to mention that most of the participants in our study first encountered conspiratorial content um, when there were shared videos or documentaries by friends or close acquaintances over social media. And I think that's kind of, it, it, it harps back, I think, to some of the points that Isabella made about the, the kind of information overload. And I think one of the ways that we kind of, um, we make shortcuts in terms of, you know, the, the, the information that we choose to trust is when we're shared information from, from close acquaintances or from friends, you know, we, we tend to kind of place too much value um, in terms of trust uh, around those things. So uh, Ellie Rose explains that the documentary pandemic really opened her eyes to all of the connections. So she says, I don't know why I didn't see it, it shows how the pandemic is a manufactured situation led by elites such as Bill Gates to profit from global mandatory vaccinations. When it was released on Facebook, my friends and I shared it with each other immediately. My housemates and I all watched it while I was sending messages to friends, lots of shock faces, emoji and devil, devil emojis. It exploded on Facebook, everyone was posting it. So this, this kind of quote, I suppose, gives us a sense of how easy it is to become engaged in conspiracy theories. Interacting with them is, is oftentimes kind of as simple as just uh, sharing content, liking posts or picking out emojis. Um, and I think it's really important that we kind of recognize the, the banality of, of a lot of these things, you know, but how easy it can be to become uh, engaged with conspiracy theories and to be immersed within those kind of communities. Um, and so this expert, I suppose, gives us a sense of how quickly conspiracy theories can circulate on social media, but also begins to give us a sense of the, the type of social connection that people receive when they engage with other truth seekers in, in online communities. And so this final piece of data then from Tina gives us a sense of the activity and sense of participation that keeps people involved in conspiracy theories. So Tina says, I did my own research to confirm, to check, to understand and to do due diligence. And that idea of doing your own research is something that's really important within uh, truth seeker communities. You know, this is the kind of, I suppose, where people move from just being consumers of information to people who are actually involved in the production of their own conspiracy theories. And that, in a lot of ways, is where the sense of social status comes within the communities, because People who can kind of deal with information that other people feel is kind of too hot to handle or too real. Um, these are the people who are kind of celebrated within the community as kind of heroic truth seekers. And I guess you can imagine that for people who are maybe largely on the margins of society, this identity and the sense of prestige and social connection that comes from it are really important in terms of understanding the, the social value involved in, in, in conspiracy communities. So I guess coming out of this then, what we can say from, from our research is that in times of uncertainty, conspiracy theories are appealing because they help some people to make sense of complex events while enabling them to connect with like-minded others and restore a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. This project is very timely. It's, it's capturing a unique opportunity, I think, you know, uh, as you've heard. And hopefully, again, I think having this talk after the other two talks from, from Isabella and from Stephen, uh, it's not going to break our, our intention. I think uh, it, it, it works either way. Uh, and I think, um, you know, what we're really doing is, as you've heard from Stephen there, there is a, this unique world environment in the last 18 months, two years, where the, the public have had to engage with scientific information in a way that we never would have foreseen or we never would have anticipated. So I think the, the ambition of Midland Science to capture that and try and understand uh, uh, so that we can improve the communication of science going forward for everybody, I think it's it's a, a brilliant uh, ambition and, and fingers crossed that it, it, it gives us some really uh, valuable insights. Uh, so I suppose my role in this or in in this uh, session in uh, in in laying the table for you know the the sessions ahead really is to talk about 
what science is and and what constitutes scientific evidence and and sources and maybe to uh, give you some ideas of what to watch out for in terms of uh, characteristics of good science and and indeed some red flags as to what might be not so good science or, or misinformation um, and uh, I've kind of themed the, the talk around the Hitchhiker's Guide to to the Galaxy uh, Duncan Adams uh, book and and you know serial and, and movie at this stage uh, because that's about you know the last two human beings in the universe on a search for knowledge and for illumination and and truth and ultimately that's what what science is you know science is this great human endeavor uh, traveling through our our world traveling through our environment trying to understand the world around us and trying to to make sense of the things that happen uh, but like any journey travel advisories are are important and i see that as my my uh, place in this uh, in this session is to to maybe flag some of the things that you, you might watch out for so that you don't end up um, you know running a cropper or uh, having having a, a an unpleasant journey um, and as you've heard and, and Stephen uh, and and uh, Isabella have both talked about how scientific information can be mutated and, and misrepresented and and uh, even even in the process of uh, mass media not even um, conspiracy theorists, but but you know what you would regard as um, as respectable journalists taking scientific information and, and spinning it in a way that you know mutates or the the nature of the research or, or the true meaning of the research in a way really just to grab attention and and what I've done here I've selected headlines I've deliberately stayed away from coronavirus uh, you know to <laughs> because uh, that's a whole other uh, anxiety inducing uh, slide of of uh, bad headlines and and misinformation and 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 just mutation of, of scientific information so what i'd like to do for the next 10 or 12 minutes is is talk about a few aspects of science as a as a human activity science as a human endeavor because that's what science is it's it's a human activity um and within that then to talk about two of the most important aspects when when you start to evaluate a, a piece of scientific information or when you're engaging with scientific information uh, and that's around information sources and how you can do your due diligence that that magical term how you can um almost uh I suppose assess for yourself self-evaluate whether you're going to put trust in the source in front of you and then we'll talk about quality of evidence uh, and again these are massive topics and we're really just uh, getting the tip of the iceberg here in a, in a 10 or 12 minute talk because uh, you know there are whole modules in universities or even degrees in universities um, focusing on these things so they're they really are big ticket items and we are just giving or taking a, a snapshot so if we think about science first and foremost as a, a human activity, um, there are two two interpretations of science. You can, you know, it's almost a noun and a verb. So it's a body of knowledge relating to a specific topic, but it's also a framework or a process for creating new knowledge. And and if you think about that journey uh, that I've, I've referenced already, we're all on that journey. We're all uh, acquiring new knowledge, but then as a species, we're at, at the edge of knowledge, we're creating new knowledge and we're, we're constantly pushing out the, the limits of human knowledge. But we need to have some system to, I suppose, evaluate the, the new information that comes to light and decide whether it is worthy of that status that we, we give to, you know, information that we rely on and, and calling it knowledge. So Stephen has, uh, was talking about the, the whole, I suppose, the aspect of, of authority. Um, and it is worth thinking about, well, how do we know anything at all? And, and as human beings and in psychology and educational psychology, we will talk about different systems of, of knowledge and knowing. And most of these, you know, as we go through life, you know, experience is, is a great information source. You know, you try things out, something works, something doesn't work. You learn from that experience. Based on that, then you develop intuition. So you don't necessarily have to do something for it to, uh, to uh, predict that there's going to be a bad outcome and rational thinking. So we become, as we again, get older and with more experience to draw on, all of that comes together and informs our, our worldview. But ultimately, the, our mature learning mostly comes from authority. Uh, and authority is a, a multi-purpose word. And, and we have what would be recognized as 
I suppose, conventional authority figures like experts, uh, you know, people who have really focused on a specific topic and, and got to a level of excellence and, and, and a level of expertise and, and are able to communicate that to others. Uh, political leaders are obviously an authority figure. They say something, they have a platform and they have followers and, and people will believe what they say and they will put stock in what they say. Uh, religious leaders obviously have, are uh, a major authority figure. Uh, people who are invested in a belief system will be heavily influenced uh, in, in terms of what the religious leaders uh, say or believe. And then influencers, which is, a, I suppose, a more general term, and, and anybody is potentially an influencer. And, and Stephen has just shown you how, with conspiracy theories, how, how uh, these truth seekers are effectively establishing themselves as influencers within their own community, and, and uh, they are establishing authority for themselves because people are following them and people will, for whatever reason, invest in their worldview. Uh, but for most of us influencers, you know, your, your teachers, your, uh, your lecturers, your family members, people that you trust, all of these are sources of, of uh, knowledge uh, from authority within your, your world. But when it comes to creating new knowledge uh, and, and that notion of science operating at the edge of knowledge, that's, that's really what we want to talk about uh, for the next few minutes. Um, so scientists, we love definitions. So this is one definition of science. You will find multiple definitions uh, when you go looking for it, but I think this one uh, serves multiple purposes. So science is a process of collecting and organizing information about the natural world. And we'll talk a little bit more about the, these uh, terms as we go on. Through repeated observation. So we're starting to see some key characteristics of good sign, uh, science here. So repetition is important. Experimentation, again, is important. Trying things out, not just doing the thought experiment, but actually testing that in a, in a real world scenario. Another related definition or run on from that is that science is objective, it's self-correcting and it's open-ended. And, and again, there are three themes that we're going to, to look at for the next few minutes. So objectivity means that as much as possible, you're trying to not be influenced by what we call biases. And, and we'll talk about biases in more detail. Um, self-correcting, and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. And that leads into the sharing of information within the, the scientific communi community, first and foremost, but then the wider community. And then the open-ended nature of science in that we, there is no end to science. And, and again, sometimes uh, for people, the wider public, that's a frustrating aspect of science. Uh, sometimes people like to put a full stop at the end of something and say, have you got an answer to this? And most scientists or, or people with scientific training will you know, have a deep sense of unease with ever drawing a, a line under something or putting a full stop. Uh, one of our favorite terms is as, as far as we know, uh, because the journey of knowledge discovery is an ongoing, constant activity, and it's very uh, disconcerting for a scientist to be asked to, to draw a line and say, is that the answer? Um, because science continues on, and as new information comes in, there's always the opportunity to revise the current worldview. And over this course of events, you're going to hear about some of these big ticket items uh, like you know, new medicines, public health, coronavirus, and vaccines, all of these big issues where science has brought us to a level of maturity that as, as a species in terms of our knowledge base that 100 years ago, 200 years ago, um, we never would have foreseen. Uh, so science is an incredibly powerful process uh, for generating new knowledge and for evaluating new information to determine whether it should uh, you know, graduate to being official knowledge. Um, so let's just think about the, the process of science and, and uh, I suppose put a little bit of color to the, the definition that I, I put up a few minutes ago. As a scientist, the, the first thing that you do is you look at the world around you. You're, you're observing the natural world. You're looking for, in particular, you're looking for problems. You're looking for issues. You're looking for things that need a solution. Uh, and, and as it, the simplest level, scientists are, are problem solvers and, and they're, they're solution seekers. So that process of looking at the world and, and, and finding problems that need a solution is, is the first step. And once you've identified the, uh, the problem that you're going to tackle, the next stage is generally trying to come up with a, what we call a scientific hypothesis, a, a framework or an idea that maybe explains or predicts something about that, the, the observations that you've made. 
the next really important step in, in a scientific process and uh, is, is the experimentation or the testing of it. So it's one thing to do the thought experiment to come up with a hypothesis and say, I think this is why this happens, or I think this drug is going to kill cancer cells, or I think that this medicine is going to protect people against developing cancer later in life. They are thought experiments, and without the next step of testing it, that hypothesis is never going to graduate onto the, the level of knowledge or, or adding to the knowledge base. So that experimentation is, is really critical for, for good science. Um, so it's, it's about trying things out. And, and the important thing about experimentation and the approach to experimentation that scientists take is we don't try and prove our own ideas. We design experiments to disprove our ideas. And that sounds counterintuitive, but if you think about it, it's actually a great way of protecting the system against false information. Because as a scientist, if I am testing my idea and I'm doing everything I can to actually disprove my idea, it's a way of reducing my bias. So obviously I've skin in the game. If I have an idea and I'm invested in it and I want it to be correct, obviously, then you know I could be lulled either consciously or, or subconsciously into you know, selecting the information that supports my idea. But if I'm actively looking for information to disprove it, it changes the dynamic. And, and falsification is a really important component in, in science. So in the course of experimenting and, and testing your idea and trying to disprove it, new information will, will emerge. And quite often, your first hypothesis, sorry, almost without fail, the first idea, the first hypothesis version is, is immature. And, and so that information feeds back into the hypothesis. You might modify your hypothesis, change your, your idea or your framework a little bit, and then you test it again. And that's an iterative process where you go around and around, you change the hypothesis again because it's not quite right. And eventually you'll reach a situation where you have a, a mature set of experiments and, and you're, you've reached a, a hypothesis that you have confidence in because you haven't been able to disprove it. And then the most important step in science is dissemination or, or, or telling other people because there's no um, there's no point in you know making a great discovery and then sitting on it for fifty years or a hundred years and there's there's a great story about Charles Darwin and uh, you know the theory of of evolution um, that he basically came up with this brilliant earth shattering idea wrote wrote the book and, and put it in the drawer for for twenty years and it was only when he realised or he got a heads up to say that he might get gazumped, that somebody else had, had come up with the, the idea independently and he was going to get uh, beaten uh, to, to publishing it, that he actually went and published it. So if you don't tell other people about your, your ideas and your, your results, then it's, it's a pointless exercise. The most important aspect of telling other people is not just about telling the world at large and the general public, but it's about telling other scientists and, and other scientists who maybe work in the same field as you and possibly even are competing with, with you. Um, and that means that there is independent replication. And this is really the self-correcting aspect of science, because when other scientists uh, start to test your ideas, again, they're trying to disprove them. And they have a great incentive to disprove your idea, particularly if it's in, in uh, competition with their own. Uh, so if your hypothesis holds up, if the scientific hypothesis, the idea holds up against all of that scrutiny and that external testing, that's pretty good evidence that you're on the right track. And that is, in a nutshell, what science does on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, but it's important that we always keep in focus that science never proves anything. All that we do is we either reject or, or don't reject a hypothesis. We either, we don't prove something to be true, we, we fail to prove that it's not true. Uh, and, and that's an important kind of a, a mindset to have when you're when you're thinking about science um, and when we reach that situation where uh, something has been published uh, it's been replicated by different people around the world it's been tested and nobody has had you know serious reason to reject the hypothesis that's the state that we were talking about being scientific consensus which is really just a general state of agreement around the idea um, but it, everything continues to ongo, uh, uh, you know, to undergo scrutiny, and everything continues to to undergo trial by ordeal. You know, people again. We, there's no end to science; it's a, an ongoing activity. There's no point where we say that's done, because there is always the opportunity for new information to emerge that might invalidate 
uh, an idea or a hypothesis. Theory is an interesting word, and it, it's something that, again, misinformation uh, uh, peddlers and, and conspiracy theorists quite often use it as a weapon against science. And it's really just through a, a, a con confusion about language. So, so when a scientist talks about theory, that's almost our reserve term for a hypothesis that has stood the test of time. So, so a theory, in a way, for a scientist is, is the ultimate accolade. It's, it's a, an idea or hypothesis that has been tested countless times by lots of different people, and nobody has found evidence to either falsify the theory or to, to reject the, the hypothesis. And you know, some of these most important pieces of scientific knowledge are, are theories. So we have the theory of, of general relativity, the theory of evolution by natural selection, germ theory of disease and quantum theory. And they're just uh, a few of the big ticket ones that everyone re recognizes. Uh, so theory is, is not just an idea. Theory in science is the ultimate. Uh, and and uh, we would all love to have our names attached to a, a theory someday. Um, a couple of other things just to say, there are limits to science. Uh, so science restricts itself. Um, and, and we don't, there, there are things that we simply don't regard as being appropriate for scientific analysis in a way. And, and those limits are defined by things, uh, where, by the hypothesis really. And, and what scientists would say is that a science, uh, hypothesis, it must be testable and it must be falsifiable. So there has to be a way to test, to do the experiments, check if something is true. Otherwise, it's not a, a valid scientific hypothesis. And science generally won't say anything about that. Uh, and scientists will be very uncomfortable if they're asked to say something about uh, an untestable um, situation or, or, or idea. Uh, so one example that often gets thrown out is, is something like cats are more intelligent than dogs. Now, the poor dogs might disagree with that and, and cat owners might, might heavily agree based on their own experience. But that's not a valid scientific hypothesis because we've no agreed way to assess intelligence in those species. So there's no objective way to actually test if that hypothesis is rejectable or falsifiable. Uh, so in the future, it might be. And, and that's the thing with science that at this point in time, you might say, well, there, that's not a valid hypothesis, but in, in 20 years time, maybe it will be. And then we can say something about it. But the science at this point in time would say, that's not something that we're, we're going to take a position on. So um, I'm just quickly going to talk about information sources and, and quality of, of in evidence. We've done a lot of the heavy lifting at, at this stage. Um, so when you're looking at a piece of scientific information, there's really two questions um, that you want to ask yourself. Number one, who's saying it? Number two, where is it being said? In relation to who's saying it, um, look at who's presenting themselves as the knowledge authority. Uh, you know, who's the author? Who is the, the person who is putting the information out there? And ask yourself, is the authority that they're claiming or they're, they're attempting to assign to themselves, is it valid? Look at, you know, their track record. Are, are they trustworthy? Do they have a reason to claim expertise in a certain uh, area? You know, have they studied it themselves? Have they published research, peer-reviewed research in the area? Do they have conflicts of interest is a, is a really important one. And, and sometimes that information is hard to find, but Obviously, if somebody is being uh, paid by a company and then they start publishing information, telling the world how brilliant uh, the company's products are, that's not an ideal situation. And it's something that you need to factor in when you're, you're evaluating what weight you're going to give to that, that particular information or, or publication or, or knowledge source. Where it's being said also matters. And, and there are, the reason it matters is because there are widely varying levels of scrutiny. Uh, depending on where you publish something or where the information is is made available. Um, so at the top of the pile, we're going to put academic or scholarly publications. And I'll talk more about those in a minute. By and large, we're talking about scientific journals or, or published academic journals. Down from that, we'd probably talk about trade publications. So, so these are not your standard kind of off the shelf media uh, publications. They tend to be focused on specific areas. They tend to be a, a higher level of expertise to engage with them. But the, the care you need to take is that quite often there's sponsored content in there and they're being, you know, maybe the, the magazine is sponsored by a company or by a, an industry group. So obviously that's going to color uh, what might potentially uh, be presented there. Mass media put at the bottom of this triangle, um, you know, uh, 
general interest articles, they tend to lack detail. You won't find references in, in, in general in mass media. Uh, quite often it'll be unsupported claims and plain and simple advertisements and, and sponsored content. Uh, so um, what you'll notice is I've put, put mass media at the bottom of this pyramid, uh, but it's not in red because that's reserved for a different uh, pyramid, which doesn't have a top. Uh, and, and, you know, Stephen and, and uh, Isabella have already talked about social media and the internet and and the you know the potential toxicity there and the, the level of care that you need to take so let's look at the top of the pyramid the the highest level or what we regard as the highest level in terms of reliability and even within within that again there's a, a hierarchy so at the very top we put what we call systematic reviews which are uh you know doc, uh, articles which collect up massive amounts of information about a topic and reach a conclusion uh, and almost give a state of the nation but it's the the key with a systematic review is that it's it's collecting up a lot of information over a long time. Uh, so it's not a, a kind of a one-off. Down from that, we have peer-reviewed research papers, which again, the peer review is when other scientists are evaluating the work. So it, that's a barrier to entry here. So again, it's, it's almost like quality assurance. Um, but peer-reviewed research papers, uh, they tend to be on smaller studies and they're done by individual research groups or even individual researchers. So the weight of evidence is, is lower than a systematic review. and then at the bottom of this particular pyramid is, is conference communications, which again, they're, they're a, a strong form of information, a strong form of uh, communication, but quite often they're not peer reviewed. Uh, you will find them online. So you might find an abstract for, for something that somebody is, is presenting at a, at a conference. And if it's not a peer reviewed publication, you need to handle with care and, and have your spider senses tingling. So just to finish up, and I'm, I'm going to go through this really quickly because I've, I've uh, pretty much uh, used all of my time at this stage. Um, public enemy number one in terms of data quality is always bias. So for any scientist, bias is, is the, the big enemy. And in terms of bias, there are, again, lots and lots of different types of bias, and we don't have time to talk about them all. Um, but it's an issue mainly because, surprise, surprise, scientists are people, and people tend to have biases that can be unconscious, they can be conscious, uh, and, and the bias in, within science that we focus on are, are tend to fall into the categories of either selection bias or information bias. Selection bias tends to relate to how a study has been designed or set up, so maybe the, the people that have been invited to take part are not representative of the wider population, or the information bias, the other side of the fence, tends to be how the data is analysed or how it's been interpreted. So the sort of things to watch out for when you're assessing the, the evidence quality in any publications is things like looking at the size of the sample. You know, how many, how many times was the experiment done? How many people were, were uh, involved in the study? And as a rule of thumb, more is, is generally better. The, the bigger a sample size is, the more reflective it's going to be of the, the wider population. Um, things like randomization. Uh, help to reduce bias. It's very difficult to eliminate bias, but you can certainly reduce it. Uh, and of course, replication, repeating things, not just doing it once and saying, oh, I found this really interesting observation. Uh, doing it again and again is, is really important. And of course, controls and scientists will, will always be obsessed with controls, something to compare against. So if you're using a medicine, for example, you have to have a control group, a group that don't receive the medicine, because otherwise, it's very difficult to draw a conclusion about what the effect of the medicine is, either a positive effect or a negative effect. On the other side, for information bias, two of the, the big ones are, are confirmation bias. So that's really cherry picking where, and again, it can be conscious or unconscious. We've all done this and we probably all recognize this in ourselves at time. We, we tend to gravitate towards information that confirm our own beliefs uh, or confirm our own ideas. Um, and, and that's something you have to constantly watch out for. Uh, another big one is pattern spotting, and, and again, we've probably all experienced this. You know, if you've ever looked at the the, the sky on a cloudy day and seen a face or recognised a face, or, or uh, you know, some people will see uh, maybe the face of a, a deity in a, a slime, slice of burnt toast or in a, in a water pattern on a wall. It's because our brains have evolved to spot patterns, and again, it's a it's an intrinsic human uh, feature that in science we have to be very aware of and we have to push back against. Uh, but even when you're collecting information, it's very, uh, our brains are almost predisposed to try and make connections that 
that don't exist or to spot patterns that aren't there. Um, and one of the best examples is uh, the gambler's fallacy. So it's it's you know, how how serial gamblers sometimes convince themselves that they can spot a pattern in lotteries or or in in casinos where you have these entirely random processes uh, going on. So to finish off, uh, a quick list of things that you can do to assist you on your, your journey through scientific knowledge. Uh, the first thing I think is consider your own biases. So there's no point in looking at scientific information and trying to detect if there is bias in there. If we're not aware of our own kind of predilections or, or our own predispositions. Um, so a little bit of self-reflection to say, well, am I resistant to this idea before I even read it? Am I going to to look at this knowledge or information with an open with an open mind? Uh, and and just taking that step is is an important first step. The other thing, and, and before you read anything, is always put on your skeptic hat. Uh, so scientists are the most skeptical people you will ever meet. Scientists will always look at a piece of information and evaluate it and and scrutinize it to death. Uh, and and if you're doing if you're engaging with the the information, you should do the same thing. Identify the sources. So who is involved in the publication? What type of publication is it? Is it a peer-reviewed journal article or is it a blog that you're reading online? What organization has put it out there? Is it somebody maybe with a conflict of interest? Is it a company who are maybe trying to promote the use of a certain product? Watch out for red flags. So we've talked about some of the sources of bias. Other you know, commonly ones, uh, misused ones are correlation causation. So taking two independent data sets uh, sticking them together, mashing them together, and trying to convince people that there's some causation involved uh, with two completely independent uh, sets of data. And the final thing I'd always say is, uh, it's, it's always served me well, is to think about how extraordinary the claim is, because uh, one of the greatest scientists of the, the last century, uh, Carl Sagan, uh, I have this, uh, or a version of this, pinned to my wall, my office wall in, in UCD, um, what counts is not what sounds plausible, not what we would like to believe, not what one or two witnesses claim, but only what is supported by hard evidence, rigorously and skeptically examined. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the more extraordinary the claim is, the level of expectation uh, rises significantly in terms of what would constitute solid supporting evidence.